An Airbus A320 had just taken off from LaGuardia Airport in New York, suddenly find itself encountered with a flock of large birds, causing both engines flame out. The pilots of Flight 1549 only had a few minutes to save themselves and everyone on board. Does this plane able to return to LaGuardia or divert to any airports? And how it become a miracle of the Hudson that we all know today? Let's find out and enjoy the show. January 15, 2009. LaGuardia Airport, New York. The story of U.S. Airways Flight 1549 started at 2.10 p.m. at LaGuardia Airport in New York City, where it preparing for a flight as Cactus 1549 to Seattle, with a stopover at Charlotte. Flight 1549 was the last flight of a four-day trip sequence for the flight and crew members, and the second flight of the day in nine years old Airbus A320-214, registered as November 106 Uniform Sierra. Manufactured in June 1999 and delivered new to U.S. Airways in August of the same year. At the time of the accident, it had flown 25,241 total flight hours, and 16,299 total cycles. Powered by two CFM-56 engines, a same type of engine use on Boeing 737 Next Generation, but with different engine shape. The pilots of this flight are 57 years old Captain Chesley Sully Sullenberger, which I going to prefer him as, Captain Sully, for the rest of the video. A former U.S. Air Force fighter pilot, a glider pilot and expert on aviation safety, with 19,663 total flight hours, including 4,765 hours on A320. Captain Sully began his commercial flight on February 25, 1982 with Pacific Southwest Airlines or PSA for short, a regional U.S. airline mainly served in the west coast of United States, Hawaii, and Mexico, before merging into U.S. Air, which later became U.S. Airways in 1998. On his right side is 49 years old Captain Jeffrey Skiles, who served as the first officer of this flight, which I would prefer him as, First Officer Skiles. He was hired by U.S. Airways in 1986, and had flown with different types of aircrafts, before end up with A320 in 2008. At the time of the accident, he had accumulated 15,643 total flight hours, including 37 hours on A320. However, this is his first time flying real A320. There were 150 passengers and 5 crew members on board, making total of 155. At 3.24 p.m., Flight 1549 takeoffs from Runway 4. First Officer Skiles is flying a plane, while Captain Sully monitoring the aircraft. One minute later, LaGuardia's local controller handled Flight 1549 to departure controller, who instructed Flight 1549 to climb and maintain Flight Level 150. Captain Sully acknowledged the instruction. Two minutes later, Captain Sully states, birds, followed by thumps and the engines went silent. The aircraft was on 2,818 feet, and 4.5 miles northwest of LaGuardia when it struck with the flock of Canada geese, a large wild goose weighed between 2.4 to 6.5 kilograms, beyond the weight that CFM-56 can handle. This is important because During the bird strike test on CFM-56 engine, the birds they used during certification for testing, were just 1.1 kilograms. But Canada goose was almost three times bigger than one used on testing. So, what happened next is, when these geese got ingested into the engines, they damaging the fan blades, engine cores, and the fracture of several compressor blades, which caused the sufficient damage to the engines, prevent them to able to produce thrust and restart again. 
This later confirmed by CVR recorded First Officer Skiles saying, uh oh, and Captain Sully saying, we got one, no, both of them are rolling back. Realizing that both engines went shut down, Captain Sully switched on the APU, a device mounted at the tail of the aircraft, that gave an aircraft energy when the engines were not operated. And takes control of the aircraft, while first officer monitoring and work on the checklists. The aircraft continued climbing further for 19 seconds, reaching 3,600 feet and the airspeed of 185 knots. Then, it begins to descend with the speed increases to 210 knots. Ten seconds later, Captain Sully calls First Officer Skiles to get QRH or Quick Reference Handbook for Dual Engine Failure, and declared Mayday to Air Traffic Control, stating that he had lost both engines and wanted turning back to LaGuardia. Cactus 15.9, turn left lane 270. Uh, this is uh, Cactus 1539, hit first, lost thrust, I'm told it's returning back towards LaGuardia. Okay, uh, you need to return to LaGuardia, turn left heading of uh, 220. 220. At 3.27 p.m., First Officer began conducting Part 1 of the QRH engine dual failure checklist, stating, if fuel remaining, engine mode selector, ignition, and the captain responded, ignition. Then, he idles the thrust levers and later stated, airspeed optimum relights. 300 knots, we don't have that, and the captain responded, we don't. While both pilots were handling the consequences of bird strike, LaGuardia halted all flights, to give flight 1549 more space for an emergency landing. Then, they gave 1549 by saying that all runways at LaGuardia are available, but Captain Sully is indicating that he won't able to do it. Act is 1529. We can get it for you. Do you want to try to land 1813? We're unable. We may end up in the Hudson. I can't get 1549. It's going to be left traffic to runway 31. Not able. Okay, what do you need to land? Remember, a powerless Airbus was flying over dense populated area of New York City. And without engines, the aircraft was unable to maintain attitude, every turn the pilots made, the plane starts losing attitudes it had, and no one want to take a risk flying over those buildings, because you might crash into them and can cause a huge disaster. So, what Captain Sully do is gliding the aircraft over Hudson River, and saw another option. Teterboro Airport, a general aviation airport on his right side, which both runways were long enough for Flight 1549 to land. Cactus 1549, runway 4 is available if you want to make left traffic to runway 4. Idiot, okay, I'm not sure we're runway. Uh, what's over to our right? Anything in New Jersey, maybe Teterboro? Okay, yeah, off your right side is Teterboro Airport. Do you want to try to go to Teterboro? Yes. At 3.29 p.m., Captain Sully announces via public address system, this is the captain, brace for impact, while first officer continues to start the engines. In the cabin, the flight attendants shout brace, brace, and head down, stay down, in order to prepare of emergency landing. For you who don't know, is to keep your upper body behind the seat in front of you, from whiplashed upon landing. Meanwhile, LaGuardia Departure Control contacted Teterboro Airport, who said all runways at Teterboro are available. But Flight 1549 was just flying past George Washington Bridge at 900 feet. It's now too low to reach both LaGuardia or Teterboro. So, Captain Sully made his decision that he's going to do a ditch at Hudson. Cactus 1529, turn right 280, you can land runway right. 1 at Teterboro. We can't do it. Okay, which runway would you like at Teterboro? We're going to be in the Hudson. Um, I'm sorry, say again, Cactus? At 3.29 p.m., First Officer Skiles told Captain Sully that he was unable to restart the engines, and Captain Sully asked him to pull the flap out, which he gave Captain Flap 2. 30 seconds later, he calls out, I gave you flap. You have 170 knots and at 250 feet. 
Then, he asks, you got flap two, you want more? Captain Sully replied, no, let's stay at two. At this time, LaGuardia controller lost the radar contact of flight 1549, but still continued to communicating with the captain stating. Cactus 1549, radar contact is lost. You also got Newark Airport up at 2 o'clock in about 7 miles. At this point, as the aircraft come closer to the water, GPWS repeatedly sounded. Terrain, terrain, terrain. Cool, huh? Captain Sully is starting to prepare to flare, which is to lift the nose up for a smooth landing or butter landing if you like to call. The plane is now few meters from the water, Captain Sully asked First Officer Skiles for other ideas, First Officer turned back and replied, no, not really. As Captain Sully trying to flare as the aircraft come closer to the water, but because of Alpha Floor Protection, a system that prevent pilot to stall an aircraft. Flight 1549 speed was so low, the aircraft didn't want to flare as he needed it to. He pulled the stick all way back and last thing he said on CVR is, okay, let's brace. At around 3.30 p.m., Flight 1549 landed on the surface of Hudson River. The aft section strikes first and got damaged, the water starting get in from that section. Within seconds, the evacuation starts, and the flight attendants redirect all passengers toward the overwing exits, and the front exits onto inflatable slides. The flight crews then go back into the cabin, and do a sweep of a cabin to make sure that all passengers and crews were evacuated, before being the last to leave an aircraft. Fortunately, before the plane gone down, the air traffic control had contacted the Port Authority in New York and Coast Guard to prepare to assist with rescue. And the area where Flight 1549 landed, was so close to many boats. So, within minutes, they came and began to pick up the survivors away from the freezing water of Hudson. The last person was taken off from the plane at 5 minutes to 4. In the end, all 155 people were been rescued. 95 people got minor injuries and 5 got serious injuries. The National Transportation Safety Board launched the investigation to find out what caused the crash. During the subsequent investigation, the NTSB used the flight simulators to test if it was possible to bring Flight 1549 to land at LaGuardia and Teterboro, which turned out to be a success. But Captain Sully debates that. The simulations are unrealistic, because they do not take human factors into account, such as the element of surprise, the time required for analysis and decision making, and the significantly higher stakes he and Jeff faced, the simulation pilots knew in advance of the situation that they would face and of the suggested emergency action, were able to practice the scenario several times, had no passengers to think about, and were in no danger themselves. So, the NTSB accepts his criticism. They added 35 seconds delay and try again and... Eureka! None was unable to reach LaGuardia and Teterboro. So, the investigators had made concussion that, Captain's decision to land at Hudson River was a right thing to do. On May 4, 2010, NTSB issued the final report, which identified the probable cause as... The ingestion of large birds into each engine, which resulted in an almost total loss of thrust in both engines and the subsequent ditching on the Hudson River. The final report also gave credit the outcome of factors, which saved all 155 lives as 1. Good decision-making and teamwork by flight crews. 2. This A320 was certified for extended overwater operations include the life vests for all passengers and crews, additional raft slash slides, even though it was not required to be so equipped. 3. The performance of the cabin crew members during the evacuation, and 4. The proximity of the emergency responders to the accident site and their immediate and appropriate response to the accident. 
The A320's fly-by-wire design was also been given an insufficient credit, by which the pilot uses a side stick to make control inputs to the flight control computers. The computers then impose adjustments and limits of their own to keep the plane stable, which the pilot cannot override even in an emergency. This design allowed the pilots of Flight 1549 to concentrate on engine restart and deciding the course, without the burden of manually adjusting the glide path to reduce the plane's rate of descent. However, Captain Sully said that, these computer-imposed limits also prevented him from achieving the optimal landing flare for the ditching, which would have softened the impact. As the result of the crash, NTSB released 30 different recommendations, include that the pilots needed to be trained for these kinds of emergencies at low attitude. To able make ditching with or without engine powers. The development of the checklist and procedure for a dual engine failure at a low altitude. Require Airbus operators to amend the ditching portion of the engine dual failure checklist, which include turning off the GPWS warnings, etc. Captain Sully retired on March 3, 2010. At the end of his final flight, he was reunited with First Officer Skiles and a number of the passengers from Flight 1549. In May of the following year, he was hired by CBS News as an aviation and safety expert. And from February 3 to July 1, 2022, he served as U.S. Representative of International Civil Aviation Organization or ICAO with the rank of Ambassador. First Officer Skiles and other two flight attendants of Flight 1549 are now working with American Airlines, who U.S. Airways had merged in 2015. For November 106 Uniform Sierra? Well, she managed to escape the scrapyard, the Carolinas Aviation Museum in Charlotte, North Carolina acquired her, and displayed her at a miracle on the Hudson exhibit, where her and the plane's engines becoming the centerpiece attraction for the museum. In 2022, the museum was later renamed as Sullenberger Aviation Museum, in the honor of the Captain Sully and the crews of Flight 1549. End of the story, and, stay safe.